Hey friends, in today's video, I'll walk you through the four key metrics you must track to build a $10 million business. Friends, I've been a business owner now for more than 30 years and I've sold companies for more than $10 million. I've learned that you don't have to overcomplicate things by tracking dozens or hundreds of metrics. However, you must calculate and track these four metrics. So you ready? Let's dive in. The first metric is known as the net promoter score. Now, the net promoter score measures your customer's satisfaction and its loyalty. It's a simple way. I like things simple. It's a simple way to gauge the health of your customer relationship and predict business growth based on customer referrals and repeat business. So a high, the higher the net promoter score, the stronger your market position and your brand loyalty. And an opposite, if it's a low net promoter score, then we have a lot of work to do. So how do we calculate the net promoter score? Well, it first begins with a customer survey. You want to ask your customer how likely they are to recommend your business to somebody else. It's a simple question. And you want to scale it like on a 0 to a 10 ratio. So 1 to 10 or 0 to 10. However, your software will allow you to do that. So that's step one. The second step is you want to dissect the results. And you want to label the top 10 percentile. So if you're doing 0 to 10, those who scored a 9 or a 10, those are your promoters. Those are your promoters. And then those that score below 6 on a range of 0 to 10, those are your distractors. So once you get your list back from this survey that you're going to conduct, separate, identify your promoters, top 10 percentile, and your distractors are typically the bottom 60 percentile of your grade. Now, the last step in determining your net promoter score is you want to subtract the percentage of the distractors from the percentage of the promoters to get your net promoter score. So, have whatever your total number of distractors were, you want to subtract that percentage from the percentage of your promoters, and that helps you gain your true net promoter score. Why does this matter, friends? The higher the net promoter score, the more solid your business is, the lower your net promoter score, the more weak your business is. So once you do this assessment, if you find that the score is really low, there's a lot of work to do. And this is what we coach our clients on on a regular basis. So that's the first metric. And it's important to understand how to grow your business. However, you're not going to miss one of the final metrics. It's a game changer. Once I understood this, it changed my life. The second metric that we have to know is what's called a customer acquisition cost. You often see this abbreviated when you read journals as a CAC. Now, it's essential for understanding how much money the company spends to acquire each new customer. You want to track your customer acquisition cost because it's vital in understanding the lifetime value of your customer. So these are a couple of different calculations that come from the customer acquisition cost. You want to ensure that your customer acquisition cost is as low as possible. And keeping the customer acquisition cost low, it means that you're running an efficient business. So how do you calculate the customer acquisition cost? First thing you're going to do is you're going to look at your P&L. Hopefully you're tracking one. And you're going to add up all of your spending on marketing and sales. Everything that was spent to get the customer to sign on the dotted line, if you will, or make that purchase. So you want to calculate what is that total number? Now, you want to divide that number by the number of new customers gained, and that's going to give you the average cost that it takes for you to acquire each customer. So if, when you do this calculation, if you see that your cost is extremely high, now we've be, got to begin strategizing between your marketing plan and your sales plan to lower your customer acquisition costs. So now tracking this metric is important, and if you do it properly, it can allow your business to move from being stuck in the weeds to ultimately reaching that $10 million value that we're aiming for. Now, we're getting to the last point, but before we get there, I want you to look at number three, your cash flow from operations. Like, Justin, that's a no-brainer. You know, you would think so, but you would be surprised at how many business owners really don't know how to determine if they're profitable or not, and some business owners just look at their checkbook as if, hey, I look at my bank register, and if I have enough money here, then I'm in good shape. We need to dive a little bit deeper than that. So when we look at cash flow from operations, what we're ultimately examining is the amount of cash generated from the company's regular operations. It's indicating the ability for us to sustain our operations or it's reflecting, do we have an upward trend? Are we moving in the direction where our growth in revenue, perhaps our growth in NOI, net operating income, is moving in the right direction? Now, it's critical to calculate your cash flow because you can look at things 
Hey, do I have enough money for payroll this month? Should I pay a dividend? Should I reduce debt? One of the things that I personally like to do is I like to look at my NOI and decide how much of that NOI am I going to reinvest back into my company this this month, this quarter, this year, versus how much am I going to take out of the company for a dividend or for my own personal use. Oftentimes, we business owners, we start taking money out for our own personal use, and we don't think about the ebbs and flows of our cash flow in order to say, how much of this do we need to invest back into our company? I recommend that you review your previous month's financial statement no later than 10 days into the new month. So if you're working in this process or if you're being coached by my team, what we're going to tell you to do is, first of all, outsource all of your financial obligations to perhaps a CPA. Then work with your CPA to have them provide you audited financial statements no later than the 10th of each month. So whenever I get my financial statements from my CPA, it shows me the cash flow in an income statement or profit and loss for the previous month and year to date and trailing 12 months. So it shows me what we've done in three different slivers of time. It also provides me my balance sheet. With these three data points, I can now calculate where my business is trending. Are we trending in the direction I need to go or did something happen? You know, one of the comments I often have from business owners is, man, last month was just awful. And then we'll start looking at why. Sometimes it's sickness. People were sick and they weren't able to produce or they had to cancel a lot of appointments. Sometimes it could be weather. In East Tennessee, if it snows, the whole town shuts down. So if we understand what's happening in each micro moment, we can look back in one month. But by looking back over a year's trailing or looking back at six months or a quarter trailing, we're now able to impose what do we need to do going forward over the next 30, 60, 90, or 12 months. All right, friends, the last three points, they're vital. We have to know those because they will help us drive our companies. However, this last point here changed my life. Like, Justin, what is it? Here we go. The last point is EBITDA. EBITDA is a common term that's used in the accounting world, and you perhaps have heard it at an event somewhere. Perhaps you've heard it talking with your friends. So what exactly is EBITDA? It stands for Earnings Before Interest, Taxes, Depreciation, and Amortization. What it does is it provides you insight into your company's profitability before the impact of taxes, interest, and other financial and accounting decisions. It helps you understand that the company's operating efficiently. It's a key indicator, especially for those of us who want to scale our company, borrow money, bring in partners, sell, whatever it is. Now, EBITDA in and of itself is a magical number. But what I challenge you to learn is recasted EBITDA. That's taking EBITDA and like putting a layer of icing on top of it, okay? Or if you're talking about pizza, I mean, you got a good meat lover's pizza and they just put some green olives or black olives on top of it. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. It's just good. So recasted EBITDA is basically looking into your company's financials and saying, hey, here are some one-time expenses that we can add back into our standard EBITDA number that our CPA would provide to us. Here are some expenses that I personally, as the business owner, is using out of the company that we can add back. So when you recast your EBITDA, what you're thinking like is an investor. See, when the time comes for you to transition your company to another party, hopefully that eight-figure exit that we all aspire to have, whenever that time comes, an investor is going to say, okay, we see your EBITDA on your financial report, but which of these expenses are one-time or which of these expenses are out of the normal? Which of these expenses are for you personally that we need to add back into the overall data? Why that matters is, is your EBITDA may be, for example, $100,000, just as an example. But when you recast it, it may go up 20, 30, 40%. So now if we're using a multiple approach to the valuation of your company, if we say 100,000 times a multiple of three, that's going to give us a $300,000 valuation. But what if recasting it is 150000 and the multiple is still three. Instead of a $300,000 valuation, we're now looking at a $450,000 valuation. So understanding how to recast EBITDA was the metric that changed my outlook. It changed the way I moved into business. It changed my decision-making on the day-to-day operations of the company. So now that you know which metric you need to start tracking or which metric you need to dive in on and begin tracking a little bit more efficiently, 
Friends, you can go out and continue your journey to build this eight-figure business, this business that's worth more than $10 million. Now, look, it's going to take a lot more than just these four metrics to drive your business to eight figures. It's going to take an exact blueprint, something that's going to show you how to get from where you currently are to where you want to be, or how to scale a business from zero, if you will, to $10 million value or greater. And that's exactly what I talk about in a video that I created last week. So check that out here, friends. And until next time, let's continue to build our dream business. Y'all make it a great day.